It's Wednesday morning. Time for another Ask Chuck Dixon, where you get to ask Chuck Dixon, that's me, about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living is I write comic books. Uh, so let's get to the questions. John asks, of all the Batman crossovers, why didn't we get a Batman and Jason Voorhees? Um, I guess because no one ever thought of it. Which, um, maybe they should have, because in the 2000s, uh, Wildstorm, which was part of DC at that time, um, was publishing a series of comics based on the New Line horror franchises. Um, Friday the 13th, uh, Leatherface, and A Nightmare on Elm Street. So um, I don't know why they didn't think of a crossover. Uh, a Batman crossover would have been kind of cool, it would have been exciting, would have been interesting. Uh, I wouldn't have mind writing um, any of them, frankly, because as I've said before, I'm a crossover whore. I, I love crossovers. I find them to be an interesting challenge because you have to um, highlight both characters. You can't short shrift either end of a crossover. And uh, it helps, um, crossovers kind of help explore and add resonance to things in, in my mind. I, I don't see them as cheap gimmicks. I see them as interesting exercises in building, you know, like almost, well, an alternate fictional world where these characters could meet. Um, the challenge, of course, would be Batman would face villains who are undefeatable. Um, so, you know, I would imagine the fight would end in a draw. Uh, these characters are undefeatable by the very nature of their portrayal in their own franchises. Uh, they're also undefeatable because they, they, they can't be destroyed or killed uh, because the franchise would die with them. Uh, these are bad guys who support a franchise, so that they have to continue on being bad guys. But Batman could certainly thwart them. Uh, so he's, a, he's an expert thwarter. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it could be pretty cool. Uh, I, I, if I had to pick from the three, I would love to see Batman versus uh, Freddy Krueger. Um, I think that would be interesting. Uh, imagine the dreamscape that Freddy would come up with for Batman. That, that would be epic, actually. So, yeah, it, <clears throat> it didn't happen, and I think only because no one thought of it, because there wouldn't have been any legal complications, seeing as New Line is uh, part of Warner's. So, you know, it's all, it's all under the same umbrella. Little sip of tea there. Uh, next question. Neil Matthews. Chuck, what's your favorite Punisher look? Is it the classic white boots and gloves look? The more paramilitary look and all black combat outfit? Or the t-shirt and trench coat look? Or even a combination of these? Thanks. Um, yeah, the go-go boots were cool when he was a Spider-Man villain, but they really didn't work after that. Uh, because they moved Punisher more toward a, a real-world portrayal. He's a character who has to blend in on a street level. It's kind of hard to do when you're running around with, uh, you know, white dinner gloves on your hands. Uh, <laughs> oh, and, you know, that, that big skull emblem in a, in a skin-tight outfit. It's, it's you know, even, in, even on the streets of Manhattan, people would, would take a second look. Uh, so, you know, uh, Punisher had to learn to blend in and uh, I kind of like any kind of mix and match as long as he's showing up uh, with the skull logo somewhere on his chest and, and generally a, you know, a black shirt, t-shirt, tank top, you know, <clears throat> whatever. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's Mike Barron that we have to thank for the, the fact that Punisher gets the, the mix and match look, the, uh, the off the rack look. Because it, it's Mike who was the first to move him away from the uh, the superhero costume towards something more, you know, street, you know, worthy or street legal, or whatever you want to say. Um, but but he's obviously the Punisher, as long as he's got that skull logo. Um, he, he can be dressed in anything. I I, I uh, John Buscema and I put him in a um, a Guyabara camp shirt once with with the skull logo on it. It was, it was a button down shirt with the skull logo on it, which I, I you know, I, I imagine someday will pop up on Facebook and an ad and someone is producing that. And, um, 
So, and, and the thing is that most of these, most comic book characters never change costumes. And when they do, like sometimes Batman does, it's, it's generally a gimmick and it's the focus of the story is, is, you know, this odd costume from, from, you know, <laughs> you know rainbow outfits to dressing up like a gaucho. Uh, it, it, the costume becomes the focus of the story. We, we rarely ever see Batman just, um, pull one of his amazing specialized outfits out of the closet just to, uh, you know, because it, it, it fits the mission that he's on. Uh, I had him do it a few times. I, I put him in camouflage uh, for a story once where he knew he was going to be spending a lot of time in the jungle. Um, I, I had a special Nomex suit that he would wear when he knew he was facing Firefly, things like that. But generally, Batman's just in the Batman outfit, you know, whatever, whatever it takes. But more about Mike um, and, and his his changes to the Punisher, Mike kind of, you know, broke the mold on the superhero look entirely uh, with the Badger, because the Badger had a regular costume, but he didn't always wear that regular costume. He would change up into other outfits as, you know, uh, suited the occasion. And sometimes he would only be in a t-shirt and jeans and sneakers, but he had the Badger logo. The t-shirt was red. Uh, or he'd be in a tank top with the Badger logo. Uh, or he'd be in, you know, uh, dojo pants and bare feet, but he had the Badger logo on a t-shirt or a tank top or whatever. And I, when I was, I mean, when, when Badger was, you know, out from first comics and these issues were appearing, I was, you know, struggling at the beginnings of my freelance career. And I found these like inspiring. I thought, well, well look what this guy's done. He's, he's changed the whole idea of being a superhero and putting on the costume as if you have 20 of them hanging on hangers in your closet and and here uh, the badger just kind of puts on whatever he feels like as long as it's got the logo and he wears the mask he's still the badger he's still obviously recognizable as the badger so you could you could have these guys these superhero guys you know um change their look a little bit once in a while and <clears throat> but you just have to think about you know, what, what are the core elements of the costume or the core elements of their appearance that make them instantly recognizable as the character and just go with that. And I found that to be inspiring. Anthony Costelli, big fan. I remember reading some books you wrote under the What If title at Marvel back in the mid-90s. I specifically remember you tackling a story about Galactus, which was outside your more street-level stories that I was used to seeing. It got me thinking. How did you come to pen some of those issues and how were they handled from an editorial standpoint? Were you given a scenario the company wanted to have written or was it completely up to the writer's imagination? Largely, it was up to my imagination. Um, the, the way I got the job, and it, it's, not, it's not that it's unusual that I was writing cosmic stories because I'd written science fiction uh, stories before, uh, both Marvel and DC. And, and other companies. And um, it was, what was unusual about this is that it was close to the Marvel mainstream, even though they were kind of uh, apocryphal stories. <laughs> if you can call any variation of what's already fictional apocryphal. Um, uh, that was what was different. I was being allowed to write characters like Captain America and Spider-Man stuff for the first time. And that is largely because Nelly Yamtov was the editor of What If at the time, and he uh, he was my editor on Law Dog, and I had proven to him that I was reliable and conscientious and flexible and all the other things that you want in a comic book writer, and um, he's he he had to fill these slots in this book, and he asked me if I wanted to submit any pitches, which I did, and this might have been one of the first I submitted that what if Silver Surfer had not betrayed Galactus and the horrible things that would happen in, in the wake of that uh, destruction of the Earth, the Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom pursuing Galactus into space to get revenge. Um, the, the idea was largely inspired by my absolute favorite what if story, uh, what if Invisible uh, Girl had died. Uh, it was a story written by Peter Gillis, if I remember correctly, and wonderfully drawn by Ron Friends. And it uh, it was about the, it was based off the Fantastic Four annual where they 
encounter Annihilus. And in, in this version, Invisible Girl does not make it back alive from the negative zone. And Reed Richards mounts a revenge mission to kill Annihilus. And uh, it's, it's one of my favorite comics and absolutely my favorite What If issue. And I talked to Ron Friends about drawing this story, you know, my What If story. And, you know, he agreed to it. I knew Ron, but his schedule uh, got all filled up and he couldn't do it, which is a big disappointment to me. But we're still friends. <laughs> I think Ron still apologizes about it whenever we meet. But, you know, that's okay. And it was drawn by Joe Barney, who did, who did a decent job. Uh, I, I, I don't know if, I don't think that Joe Barney had much of a uh, career in comics uh, in, in the years following this. I, ne I never saw his name pop up again. I don't know anything about Joe Barney, but, you know, he did a decent enough job. But still, I, I wish it had been Ron Friends. As to, did they give us the ideas or did we give them the ideas? Most of the what-ifs I pitched, although... Nell asked me if I could come up with one for the new Fantastic Four. If you remember the new Fantastic Four when they had uh, Wolverine, Hulk, Ghost Rider, and I forget who else, be the Fantastic Four for a couple of months for God knows what reason. Um, but they wanted a, uh, a what if about that period of the Fantastic Four's history. And I was cool with it. And uh, Alcatena did the art, uh, which was stunning. Uh, and you know, I, I got to do what if, what if Punisher had killed Spider-Man things like that you know just you know daydreaming spitballing blue sky and ideas that you actually get the right stories about it was very very cool and I have to be uh, I have to thank Nell for uh, for letting me come on board and uh, do those stories Comics Gatekeeper Howdy, Chuck. What do you think of the old Batman origin retcon where Chill turns out to be a hired gun for a bank robber boss, crime boss named Moxon? Jonathan Wayne testified against him, and he swears revenge. They even have Dr. Wayne in a Halloween ball bat, Halloween ball bat-like costume at one point. When I was 11 reading greatest Batman stories ever told, I thought it was a neat twist. Um, yeah, I'm just not a fan of going back and playing with origins like this. I mean, I don't like it when they go back and play with, um, you know, who killed Punisher's family. You know, first it was a mafia. Uh, then it was some spy thing that tied to his past. I mean, you, a lot, for the most part, a good superhero origin is so elegantly told that it doesn't need embellishment. Uh, we don't need to know what, uh, you know, Jor-El had for breakfast uh, the morning that he launched his baby into space from Krypton. Um, you know, we don't need to go back and do that kind of stuff. And I hate it, especially when they feel like they've got to go back and retell Batman's origin. Uh, it, it's almost as if some of the writers want to have their own stamp on it. Uh, now I know, I know, I know, I, you know, in an issue of Detective, I went and changed the fact that Joe Till said that Joe Chill did not kill uh, the Waynes and that alley. It was another criminal and, and, and that quite possibly Batman would never know who killed his parents. Um, but I did that to fix what I thought was tampering with the origin, the original origin. Uh, you know, the Joe Chill story appears, I believe, in the 50s. And uh, even as a kid reading it, I, I read it in a reprint in a paperback little little 35 cent paperback of Batman during the Batmania craze and uh, even as a kid reading I didn't like it I didn't like that they played with the um, the classic story I preferred that it be a mystery who killed the Waynes and since uh, Joe Chill was never mentioned again for a long time I assume that the uh, editors and writers thought maybe it was a mistake too because uh, it brings into question why Batman would keep doing this after he had um, fulfilled his promise to his parents to find them justice uh but other than that little change i made to a previous continuity change i, I don't approve of of doing these things I, I i remember there was a there was a secret origins issue that told the origin of man bat i think this was like late 70s and um, the writer felt a need to include a connection between bruce wayne and kirk langstrom as children and so he wrote in a scene where a young Kirk Langstrom is at the same movie theater 
as the Waynes on that fateful night, and that Bruce leaves the theater and sort of hangs out with this strange, you know, this kid, Kirk Langstrom, uh, for a while before returning to his seat at the movie theater. And I thought, this, why would you do that? I mean, how does that connect to Man Bat later? You're just trying to uh, draw together things that really don't belong with one another. Uh, it takes away from the origin. It takes away from both origins because you're like, my God, what a, what kind of crazy coincidence is that? That's a coincidence right out of Charles Dickens. Um, and also it, it flew in the face of the origin story because, um, you know, we're led to believe that they were at the movies that night because um, Bruce wanted to see that movie. Why would he leave in the middle to go hang out with a kid he'd never met before? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I just don't, you know, leave it alone. Once the, once the origin is established, don't try to add or subtract from it. Um, it's hubris to me more than anything else, because these characters are indelible, indelible and I think their origins should be in, uh, equally indelible and you should just leave them alone. Don't play with the beginnings, the genesis of these characters at all. Craig Welter, if it's true that Marvel really did change the Punisher symbol because they don't like the kind of people who like it, for example, police and military, then it begs the question, why did the people at Marvel hate their fans so much? Why would anyone at Marvel hire people that hate fans? Hating and trying to annoy the fans of your character seems like a terrible business strategy. It kind of does, doesn't it? <laughs> it yeah i mean i think they have contempt for the punisher that this new crowd of editors and, and and quite frankly when i was at marvel writing punisher in the 90s there were quite a few editors who didn't like the punisher they sure liked to have him show up in their books because it would increase sales but they didn't like him as a character and they didn't marvel didn't seek those kind of readers even then well they certainly don't seek the kind of readers who would like the Punisher now. Uh, and in addition to their contempt for the Punisher, they, I think they also have a, this current crop of editors has a deep-seated dislike of the police and the military as well. So it's, you know, the old gang of deplorables thing. They don't want to deal with them. And they don't like the idea that they use this symbol. And I think they don't quite understand why the police and military adopted the Punisher symbol. First of all, it's one of the coolest symbols in comics. I think it's right behind Batman and Superman and Spider-Man as one of the coolest symbols. Um, it's iconic. And it's also representative of a badass. And let's face it, Frank Castle is the biggest badass in the Marvel Universe. Uh, because, you know, you could say, oh, well, Wolverine. Yeah, well, Wolverine is practically unkillable. Uh, so he can afford to be a badass. The Punisher, not so much. Uh, he's a self-made man, much like Batman. Uh, the, you know, Batman, the biggest badass in the DC universe. You know, these are both just average guys uh, with the will to uh, seek justice in their own way. And Punisher is eminently killable. He's in danger every time he leaves the house. Sometimes he's in danger when he's at home because he made so many enemies. And so I think that's what the police and military are looking at, that this is, a, this is a badass symbol for a badass character. Some of them may not even be aware that the symbol goes with a comic book character. I don't know. You know, not everybody's not into comics, trust me. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of people are not. So um, the, the woke crowd at Marvel are changing the symbol and changing Punisher's entire modus. He's carrying samurai swords now. Uh, as a, because they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed to be associated with people who probably don't share their worldview. And, and that's really as simple as it gets. And do they hate their fans? Well, yeah, except they've converted so many of their fans into non-fans now. So many people who followed Marvel for years and years have, have stopped, have gone away. Uh, they've either left comics or looking for some alternative. Uh, to what Marvel's offering. And it's, um, is it a bad business model? Of course it is. But generally, 
comic book companies are um, the, the the big two in particular are kind of clueless about their own readership. Uh, they don't know who's reading them. Uh, they don't reach out for new readers. They don't care to find out what their readers want in order to keep them reading. Uh, they stopped doing that 20 years ago. It just seems to be, as I've said before, uh, for these editors, it seems to be a stepping stone to some other kind of career. The comic books are not edited for the most part uh, at the big companies by comic book lifers, people who want to be comic book editors. They're, they're done by people who want to be something else, somewhere else. And DC and Marvel Comics looks really cool on their resume. And, uh, but, you know, in the process, they're ruining the medium, the, the, in America, anyway. Doug Olson. Maybe, Chuck, if during the 70s and 80s, you writers had created more ethnic characters in your comics other than black exploitation ripoffs, there would be no re need for race swapping. Uh, what do you mean, you writers? I, I, I wasn't writing comics in the 70s. I didn't even show up on the scene until 1986. Uh, you know, and I didn't write any black exploitation ripoff characters. I, I feel that this, this, this question is more of an accusation than a question. Is it somehow my fault that we're in a period where uh, creators and entertainment producers feel a need to pander? Um, no, that's not my fault. I have nothing to do with it. Obviously, in asking this question, you have, nothing, you have no idea of who I am. Uh, what I've done in the industry, you know, my work. I always let my work speak for itself. If you're looking for some sort of like uh, explanation of what I do <laughs> and why I do it, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you one. Because um, I, um, my history shows that I've always included all kinds of people in my work when it made sense. If I'm doing an, a modern urban story set in America, the population of that story is going to reflect the population in real life. You know, I want my stories to be relatable, appear to be honest, and appear to represent some version of a real world. It's very important to me. And so I will do what I can to make the story reflect the, the real world environments that I'm basically setting them in. Uh, so I don't see, even if I was writing in the 70s and 80s, how it's my fault that they're making some of the stupid decisions they're making today. Uh, who do we blame for, for a, a, a black Anne Boleyn in a recent production? Do we blame the court of Henry VIII for not being more inclusive? It, it just seems kind of silly to me. And also at the bottom of it all, um, I still say that it's demeaning. It's demeaning to the, it's demeaning to everybody. It's demeaning to the character. It's demeaning to the original creators. And most of all, it's demeaning to the race you're swapping to. Uh, it's as if they don't have any stories of their own to tell, that they have to take the place of a white character, a character who is intrinsically supposed to be white um, in the story. It, it, you wouldn't do that the other way. You wouldn't recast a, a, a Latino or Asian or, or African character for a white person just to be different or inclusive. Um, you wouldn't suddenly throw, you know, um, you know, an Irishman into a story about medieval Japan, just to be fair. Uh, and, you know, I just, I don't get it. You know, if there's no reason to do it, why do it? I mean, look at what's going on with Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, which they have to change to Snow and White because one actor who is a little person complained uh, through seven little person 
actors out of work and and, and who knows how many stunt doubles <laughs> because he sort of like became king of the little people all of a sudden and it, and it was up to him so so disney is is kowtowing to to little people and they're gonna side swap characters uh in the name of wokeness they they and they already have a a, a latina as as lead in the story which which doesn't really make a lot of sense as it's a it's a story about snow white and she's um uh, it's based on a medieval fairy tale set in Europe. Um, and, and what that says, is, as I said in a prior video, which is probably the video that sparked this accusation, is that, you know, Hollywood is so bereft of ideas that all they can think of is these crazy remakes and reboots and sequels and all the rest of it, whereas you have co these incredible stories from other places you know than than stuff that hollywood's already done the continent of africa is filled with terrific stories yet to be told that i'm sure audiences would love but because hollywood is based on a conservation of risk they keep going back to the same old material you know and they shake it and bake it and uh try to find some you know fresh new way to present it that you know ba basically they're they're heating up leftovers and the race swapping thing seems to be the fad now trust me uh our children and grandchildren are going to look back at this period in in the uh in the, of the last few years and and find it as laughable as we find things like reefer madness uh or duck and cover videos so <laughs> They're going to think we were all morons. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's my last word on it. As far as, you know, am I guilty? Did I do something wrong to cause all this? No, nah, I really didn't. So, sorry. Dwayne Thomas. I didn't understand the reference when you described Firefly being sexually aroused by fire and seeing the flames take on the shape of a woman as an Air Force joke. Uh an Air Force joke is something from my childhood, uh, and it was, it's a reference to a joke that adults get and kids don't. It's not a reference to the Air Force. Um, basically, you say it's an Air Force joke, it flew over their heads, is what you're saying. Uh, and it's often accompanied by a gesture where you wave your open hand over your head and go, Vroom! you know. Uh, <laughs> so it's, you know, when you were a kid, and you went to the movies with your parents and they were laughing at something that you didn't you didn't see what was funny and it's like what's so funny what it's like well we'll tell you later or, or we'll tell you when you grow up you know that's an air force joke not a reference to the air force my my dad was uh u.s army air corps world war ii i would never run down uh i would never run down the Flyboys. john lauer did you ever interact with Darwin Cook in your go comings and goings at DC? I think he's one of the true legends of comics. I agree with you wholeheartedly and truly understood what comics should be. I agree with that as well. I've seen a video of him decrying modern comics, how they've lost sight of what the medium used to be, namely escapist fiction for kids. I thought that this wasn't far from your views, thoughts. Well, the first time I met Darwin was at a convention and I didn't know who he was. I knew his work. I had seen a lot of the stuff he was doing at DC at the time. And uh, he uh, he came up to me. I was at my table. He came up to me and introduced himself and said that uh, he agreed. He had read some stuff I had said on the Internet about the state of comics at the time. And this would have been late 90s. And uh, he, was in, he was in total agreement with me. He said that, you know, it's comics are going in the wrong direction. American comics are going in the wrong direction. So, uh, but we had a lot of encounters after that. Uh, he would, um, <clears throat> he, he vacationed quite a bit here in Florida, not too far from where I live. And uh, we had lunch a couple of times. And um, uh, I saw him often at conventions. So he went to dinner with him a number of times at conventions, things like that. Um, you know, I spent, uh, you know, some time with him, but not enough, unfortunately. Uh, you know how it is. You, 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 well, if you go to conventions, you see somebody and you're like, oh, you know, yeah, and I'll talk to him. I'll talk to you more next time we meet. Well, there was no next time. 
So uh, I, you know, I remember every time I met him, and I, I remember everything that we talked about because uh, he was uh, an engaging guy. If you ever met him, he's kind of magnetic personality, um, you know, and a terrific storyteller. I, I remember him holding, you know, a, a, a dozen people in thrall in a hotel lobby late one night, talking about his early career, how how he got into comics. And it was fascinating because he, he wasn't originally a comic book guy. And uh, <clears throat> it, you know, he came from the world of magazines, uh, magazine design. He worked on top um, uh, fashion magazine, uh, the Slick magazines, and left it to, to work in comics at you know, a relatively late age for uh, someone breaking into the industry. Uh, he was a lot like me. I mean, he didn't get into the industry until, you know, he didn't get into comics full-time until later in life. Of course, you know, I didn't get in uh, until later in life. It wasn't for lack of trying because I've been trying since I left high school. But with Darwin, it was just a career change. And he brought, like, a new perspective. He brought the perspective of an adult to this comic book material. And he was very much in favor of reaching out to as many readers as possible, to not just appealing to fans, to make the work as accessible and universally appealing as you could. And because he was a, uh, you know, a triple threat, you know, he was he's a writer, artist, designer, uh, you know, he had quite a few talents. He, he was able to, um, you know, make this happen. And he was a force to be reckoned with for a little while, but DC didn't seem to know what to do with him. What they should have done with him is just said, Darwin, what do you want to do? And just let him do it. Uh, but that was not the case. Uh, they felt they knew better, which we, we know they didn't. Um, it's, it's, it must have been, it was frustrating for me as a reader uh, to see Darwin wasn't able to do all the things he wanted to do. Uh, because obviously his instincts were good. Uh, his work was always profitable for DC. Um, they, it, he just should have been seen as more of an asset than he was. I think he was to some extent. They realized they you know a cover by him or this or that. They used him in a perfunctory way rather than seeing him as a, um, a seer. <laughs> a, a, seeing that he, this was a guy with a vision. This is a guy with some ideas that could expand our readership. There was a, um, a our, our paths kind of crossed in a strange way in that we were both up at DC the same week, and we found this out later when we compared notes. We were both up at DC in, in the same week proposing basically the same idea. And the um, he, he showed up one day at DC offices proposing an all ages Wonder Woman because um, at the time Marvel was having a lot of success with Spider Girl and Spider Girl had been discovered somehow by tweeny girls uh, in trade paperback form and <clears throat> Spider Girl was selling numbers in trade paperbacks um, that most of Marvel's line wasn't selling in monthly comics I mean, we're talking big numbers in trade paperbacks, highly profitable. And <clears throat> Darwin thought, well, let, let's, let's get DC into this game <clears throat> and do a Wonder Woman series aimed at all ages, you know, young adult sort of deal, Harry Potter kind of thing. And uh, DC told him they weren't interested in that audience. Now, why, you know, why would you not? I mean, if I came to you and said, I, I have a book that will sell 100,000 copies to middle-aged truck drivers... <laughs> who cares who buys it, right? Uh, you know, okay, you can sell 100000 We don't care who you sell it to. So uh, this is what Darwin proposed, and they shot him down, which it, it's hard to believe that you would just totally poo-poo an idea like that, not say, well, what more plans do you have? Let's talk about this further, blah, blah, blah. I mean, Darwin had distribution ideas, all kinds of things uh, for, for this project. And then later in the week, I roll in for, for a meeting, and uh, I pitch a, um, a Commandi uh, all-ages book, which to me seemed like a total no-brainer. Uh, it would appeal to the same audience as Spider-Girl, because I was looking at Spider-Girl's numbers too, and I looked around DC's 
list, and I thought, what, what would really appeal to a young adult audience? And I thought, well, Commandi, the last boy on earth. The concept is in the title. It's a, it's a kid who survives a, a global uh, extinction event and uh, emerges into a world where all of his friends are talking animals. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's it's, it's tailor-made. And I remember that when they asked me what I would change from what Kirby did, I said nothing. I wouldn't change anything. I would just, you know, tell new stories. Uh, and they shot me down for the same reasons they shot Darwin down. They said they were not interested in the young adult audience. Now, you got, you got to remember, at this time, uh, we were nearing the peak of the young adult uh, fiction gold rush. And there was money on the ground to be made to appeal to that audience. And also, it would have been it would have done something that comics hadn't done in a long time, bring in young readers. Uh, and, you know, I had ideas for distribution, how we would, uh, you know, package the books and everything else so they just didn't look like the standard comic book, uh, much like Marvel had done with Spider-Girl. But it was no, no, no. So that's, you know, that's where, you know, I mean, it, this is all just to illustrate that Darwin and I were much of the same mind. Tremendous amount of admiration for that guy. And I, I, I miss him, all fandom misses him, all comics are poor for, for not having Darwin Cook with us anymore. Uh, I, you know, who knows what he might have done? Uh, who knows what new paths he would have gone down? And uh, we needed a sober voice that people would listen to, though they should have listened to him more. Dan Donovan. As you're a writer who knows a little bit about adventure comics with an aviation theme, which of these post-World War II comic strips is your favorite? Buzz Sawyer, Johnny Hazard, Steve Canyon. Well, you know, I've I, I read a lot of Steve Canyon. Uh, reread a lot of Steve Canyon. It's Milton Kniff. It's um, his follow-up to Terry and the Pirates. And I like it. You know, it's obviously wonderfully drawn, wonderfully realized. There's terrific characters that uh, Kniff was able to come up with. Um, but it's not my favorite for one reason, one reason only. The dialogue is always too cute. It's cutesy dialogue. Uh, it's, it's too full of jargon and slang, uh, too clever by half. Uh, it didn't reflect how people really talked. I felt that Kniff was um, hedging his bets by having, um, you know, hokey-jokey uh, contrived dialogue to go along with the action of the story, not, not having enough faith in the story to carry things. Or, or maybe he enjoyed writing that kind of dialogue, but he certainly couldn't have thought people talked that way. Um, or perhaps he was trying to ape the kind of, you know, repartee they have in movies, uh, particularly at the time period, but it just doesn't hit the mark for me. Um, but classic. Wonderful, amazing strip that I've, you know, read lots and lots of. I've read decades of Steve Canyon and enjoyed all of it. it but it does, that's the reason it's not my favorite. Buzz Sawyer, a, 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 another terrific aviation adventure strip, uh, marvelously uh, written and drawn by Roy Crane. It's um, got a lot of humor, lots of action, romance, all the rest of it. Uh, his dialogue does all seem real. His, his dialogue was good. Uh, he, he wasn't trying to work too hard at it. And, uh, but uh, his, his sense of design, his sense of layout, the economy and simplicity of his work that went on to inspire people, you know, like Milton Kniff, like, like uh, Alex Toth and Mort Meskin and guys like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great strip, highly entertaining, but, you know, just not my favorite. My favorite would be Johnny Hazard by, by Frank Robbins. Uh, th this is like about a two-fisted pilot, Johnny Hazard. He's a mercenary pilot. He, he might be flying fighter planes one moment, helicopters the next, or, or flying a cargo plane that's sailing into you know troubled skies. Um, Robbins was not only a, a terrific artist, again, you know, inspired by a lot of the same people that inspired Kniff, um, you know, Noel Sickles in particular, um, he was also a terrific comic writer. He really knew how to keep a story moving. And I, I admired the way that he would always get Johnny into predicaments in different ways. There was no, 
you know, Johnny just wouldn't get sent out on a mission or whatever. Most of the stories were deconstructed plot lines where Johnny sets out to do one thing and is thwarted and has to get involved in something else, you know, with, with, with spies or criminals or jewel thieves or femme fatales. And in one memorable uh, Sunday strip arc uh, with dinosaurs. Uh, so, you know, it's always fun, always fast paced. And, and his dialogue very much reflect, reflected the kind of snappy dialogue they had in movies at the time, but I think that he captured it better than Kniff did. Uh, it, it seemed more natural, more just part of the fun. Uh, and he didn't rely on it all the time when he needed straight up dialogue or he needed um, the, uh, what the characters were saying to reflect their emotions. He just went straight for it. Uh, and, but, I, but I enjoyed his wordplay and, and, and puns and things like that. They just seemed to be more uh, organic than, than Kniff's. And, uh, and, and the action and attention to detail and just, just the sheer inventiveness of this strip, which ran for I, you know, almost 40 years. Uh, and thanks to uh, a bunch of really excellent Italian reprints, I've been able to read uh, the entire run of Sundays and um, uh, Hermes Press does the uh, the dailies, but they've only done the first maybe decade so far, or decade and a half. But uh, if you can find any uh, Frank Robbins, um, Johnny Hazard to look at, I suggest it highly. Hey, and if you like that kind of, you know, uh, you know, toxic masculine. <laughs> <laughs> punch him up kind of hero uh you might like graham nolan's in fact i can guarantee you will like or love graham nolan's newest project from compass comics it's called giant size two-fisted manly tales the reason why i'm bringing it up mostly I, you know i support all of graham's projects he's done awesome work at compass he's had tremendous success crowdfunding a series of really terrific uh, monster books but now he moves into the uh the the hard-boiled uh, tough guy genre and uh, I wrote two stories here and um, it's a hundred pages it's uh, ten, 10 page each uh, you can support it at Indiegogo uh, the campaign's going really well but I want to see it reach all of its stretch goals because the final stretch goal is Graham has promised us that he will print this thing in hardcover. And I want a hardcover of this baby. It's going to be a hard book about hard men. It should be in hardcover, don't you think? Uh, so, and it's got um, some of the top talents in the business. You've got, uh, you know, you got me and Graham, obviously. Uh, my two stories, uh, one's going to be drawn by the great Dave Williams, the other by the equally great Larry Stroman. But we've also got Michael Golden, you know, Bo Smith, uh, and a raft of other talents. Mike Barron's doing a story here, uh, maybe even more than one. Uh, Andrew Paquette. I mean, I've seen some of the artwork. Butch Geis is along with us. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous package. It's worthy of your interest. It's worthy of your support. So go to Indiegogo and check out the art and the updates and all the rest of it. Sign up for the updates so you can see all the new art. Okay, if you need to contact me with questions, accusations, or whatever, <laughs> come to brunobookstore at gmail.com. Brunobookstore at gmail.com is the most reliable way for your uh, submissions to reach me. And I look at them all, and I look at them every day. Also, if you're looking for, you know, if you're distracted, if you're at work and don't feel like working, <laughs> head over, and it's safe for work, head over to chuckdixon.net. There's movie reviews, essays, pictures, and lots and lots. I, mean, I think, maybe, you know, well over 100 pages of unpublished DC and Marvel comics for you to read. Stuff that was done for inventory or whatever, but never saw the light of day. And you can only read it at chuckdixon.net. Uh, particularly a lot of Punisher stuff that never got published. So that's it for me for this week. I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for your likes and subscribing and support and for spreading the word. And I will see all of you, each and every one, down the road.